this is another podcast for the HyperArc Fascia Training, and today we have our guest, Marshall Jones. Hey, Marshall, uh, if you can uh, talk about yourself a little bit before we start. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I'm a, uh, interestingly enough, I am a trainer and speaker, and um, you know, I train people with using their voice and how to find their voice. And a lot of times when you think about finding your voice, it's more of like this kind of like concept of, you know, finding the right words or finding who you are. But I mean, literally the voice, like the one that you speak with. And so that has been a mind body journey for me. And uh, sort of a lot of the ways that I found myself with Chang Z's work um, was by way of that process of developing my, uh, my voice training program. And uh, so, yeah, I, I do that. And, uh, you know, I enjoy many different sports disciplines, you know, martial arts and, you know, doing tough mutters and things like that. And so, you know, uh, just a full body, full life kind of person. Okay, great. So how did you find out about my training? Is it through Instagram or YouTube? Um, so when I started doing more research into sports physiology, it was one of those things that just popped up. Uh, something, it was like the, sec the secrets of athleticism just showed up as a, as an option to click on. And of course, you know, you know, you hear the word secret, you know, next to something, you you know, it's like, Hey, what's the hidden information that I don't know that, you know, is little known or whatever. And it's usually one of those things that's kind of thrown around. But I went and bought that book and saw some of the examples because there was a Instagram at the time that was live with, you know, and some of the science videos on YouTube. And I saw that what this man was talking about was rooted in a very direct understanding of how the body works from the ground up. And, you know, that it was something that indeed could qualify as a secret because it's not something that you talk, you know, that I've never been to a gym class or never been to, you know, uh, an athletic studio or to a martial arts class where they specifically said anything about keeping the tension in your feet or building that area of your feet so that you can build your entire body. And when you put that together against people who are exceptional athletes. And when you keep showing all of these examples of winning athletes that have this same feature across multiple disciplines, it's sort of like, wait a minute, you have this one, it's sort of like a Occam's razor. You know, you have the one thing that can have maximum result. Um, and it's like, well, how come this isn't more out there? This was a couple of years ago. Sorry to interrupt you. Can you, can you, uh, maybe use the layman term to, dis to explain what is the Occam, Occam razor? Because some people don't understand that term. I mean, essentially, you want to get to, here's like, with anything, there is something that requires the minimum amount of effort to get the maximum result. And so it's basically the cut the bullshit razor. Like, okay, cut the crap, what do I need right now? to get the most done. And so if somebody tells you, you know, well, you have to go to the gym a certain amount of days a week and do a plethora of exercises, a version of Occam's Razor was when Tim Ferriss discovered that there was actually this very minimal amount of exercises you could do, but with a certain maximum, at a certain maximum capacity to increase muscle mass way faster with way less time in the gym. And so these things sort of go against our conventional idea of grinding or running the grindstone on a daily basis in a certain way. And so with Occam's razor, applying that to anything is applying that principle. What is the smallest thing or the least amount of effort, effort uh, that is required to get the maximum result out of whatever it is that you are endeavoring in? Right. Right. That's, yeah, that's, that's your, uh, that, I think that's a very good uh, interpretation of it. So my, I, I use that term, Occam's razor, also in my research and uh, explaining the hyperarchic mechanism. 
and the hyperarch metamorphosis towards uh, the, you know, for the relationship of the uh, athleticism. Yes. The way I use it is, is the current, uh, the current explanation in the science, in the scientific world, to explain athleticism, they use the word gene, right? Mm -hmm. They use the gene a lot. They, they try, to, try to say, okay, so the person's athletic, uh, he has uh, basically an uh, athletic gene. But then to find what that gene is, is a very complex process. Now, the Ocom Razor is explanation is, hey, you know, I don't need, uh, well, genetics obviously is a very important aspect of athleticism, but what I'm saying is, hey, there is a simpler and more elegant explanation, which is there is a fascia tensioning mechanism hiding inside the foot that nobody notices and nobody talks about, but the ancient, uh, the, the Chinese Asian martial artist, thousand years ago, uh, the, especially for the, uh, the, the the Tai Chi, the art of Tai Chi, and, and those people they, they 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 train in a different way. They train in uh, isometric tensioning, and it's very similar to my training. But my training it takes a step further. We actually tap into the mechanism directly, and we actually try to build the athlete from the ground up, right? So the, the, the version of my, my explanation to Occam Razor is, is saying, hey, there is a much simpler uh, explanation for athleticism if you just, you know, work on your foot and there is a, a metamorphosis sort of happening. It's a neurological training that happens in the foot. This is much more simpler than going to, okay, let's spend millions of dollars. Let's just try, try to identify all the genes. I, my uh, my mother actually is uh, doing the uh, genetic research at the Columbia University. I mean, right now the technology just to where there is a human genome project that's trying to identify all the genes. The, the genes there are so many genes in the human body. Just to identify, let's say the the genes responsible for growing tall, it's very difficult because there are multiple genes that's responsible for that. So you're, you're talking about, okay, uh, to determine athleticism, that's going to be much more harder. Yeah. But one aspect of it, what I'm saying is, if you look at the foot and you look at the elite athlete's foot, not just basketball, but across all spectrum of sports, right? We're talking about field and track. We're talking about tennis, uh, basketball, soccer. All the elite athletes, they all have a common denominator, common sign that's showing in their foot, which is, fascia tension in the sign of morphing and the regular people you know who have a lot of problems right keeping up you know even just trying to complete uh, you know some uh, marathon or, or, or some like one mile run they, they, they're like puffing and uh, huffing and puffing they have difficulty and they have knee pains they have chronic problems they have a lot of issues so what I'm saying is if you if you look at your foot and if you just try to compare apple to apple orange to orange get your foot to the exact level us the elite athletes you will feel much more different does that mean that you're gonna be just like the elites no because you're already starting late they they started when they were very young you are trying to catch up you're not gonna be exactly like them but the hyperhark metamorphosis is going to give you goose dominance right it's gonna give you the fascia fascia um you're gonna be more fascia driven it's gonna give you the effortless in performing so, so that's what I'm saying, and that, that's, that's I, I really like that term, uh, razors, uh, Occam's razor. Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, what I, <laughs> it's, it's so cool to listen to, to you, you know, express yourself about this, because it is, it is very simple, but then when you break down and sort of open up, well, what makes, it's like people are like, well, why, you know, like how, how and that's where all the scientists you know diving deeper into the body looking at cells and then getting you know to add all of that to get to the you know the ultimate grand truth of everything um but one of the and one of the things that i find about just the feet uh especially even in the work that i do with people you know the 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 feet through the body connect all the way up through through the fascia all the way up through your respiratory system and all the way up to your tongue, which, you know, 
most people won't even consider the idea that like, you know, when you say, oh, I put my foot in my mouth, you know, you all these little metaphors that we have. Um, but the tongue connects all the way down through the ground, through your feet. Now, the other thing that is very interesting about the feet themselves is that even in our lymphatic system, uh, both of our legs are connected to the left side of the body in our lymph system. And the lymphatic system is only activated when we move. And so to really kind of, exp to, to bring this out and expand this a little bit, your right hand and right side of your face, right arm has its own little lymphatic drainage system by itself. The rest of the body, including the left side of your face, even the left brain, because they found out that lymph goes onto, into the brain, uh, the left arm and both of your legs drain from the same pipeline. Now, why is this significant or what, is, what does this mean? Well, actually, the other thing is that the left brain, uh, the place that your, our sense of, you know, spatial awareness and all of that other good stuff is relegated to the opposite side of the brain, but only on that side of the brain. And so you have the right brain connecting to the left side of the body, which controls our sense of visual spatial awareness, and it all drains down to the feet. So basically you have these two, two things that we plant on the ground <clears throat> that comprise of about, you know, 75% of our locomotion, of our ability to even move. Uh, and it's, it's one of those things that when you think about athlete's foot, you think about a disease, right? When you think about the term, when we say athlete's foot, we talk about, you know, when it's going wrong. But the athlete's foot is where it all begins to go right. Uh, and so looking at that from that perspective and also considering that the, you know, it, this, this, <laughs> the way the nervous system is set up, the way the, the everything is set up, there's an asymmetry throughout the entire body but that asymmetry finds itself balanced at the feet. And so when we sit all day, for most of us who sit and do jobs that require us to sit at a computer, you, we are not using all of that. All of that's going to waste. So by the time you go to uh, your yoga class or you go to your gym membership thing or you do whatever it is you're doing, you're exhausted to no end because your day-to-day -day experience <clears throat> does not work with those parts of the body. And that's just what happens. Um, and it's nobody's fault per se, you know. Um, there's a woman, uh, Esther Gokhail, uh, I might be pronouncing her name incorrectly, but she had a book called Healing Back Pain, Eight Steps. And she basically went <clears throat> and she started studying uh, how people walked in, in other countries, people who were able to carry bottles of water on their heads for miles without tipping it over and you know just individuals who just didn't live the way we live by wearing shoes and everything else and one of her exercises one of her exercises is to get you to make your foot a kidney bean and she uses the baby's foot as an example <clears throat> she's like this is the way the foot is supposed to be um her she shows a picture of a man who has the hyper arch mechanism like she, that that was her example of a grown foot very taut. It looks like a claw. You know, the toes are like very, very toughened into that locked position. And she's like, this is the ideal position for the foot. And if you don't have this position for your foot, you will have back pain. And so, you know, where Chong is taking it, Chong takes it to a, 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 another level because he's talking about how we can get to exceptional performance, right, by way of this particular work. And this woman is saying, well, this is what you need to even recover from the, the damage that's already been done right. in your life. Um, and so where do you want to be is the question. Like, do you want to need this information when you have back pain and shin splints and, and your knees don't work or, you know, other, other things? Or would you want to have this information while all of those things are operational, but then they can become exceptional? Right. And yeah, that's 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 what I find very valuable about this man's work. So so when you uh, when you decided uh, at what point did you did you decide say, hey, you know, I want to I want to come over and, and see me uh, uh, take, a you know, to train, uh, take a look in person and uh, try to experience the, the training yourself. Like what, what did you want to uh, 
uh, want to find out? Well, so basically, I've always found myself to be a very motivated self-starter. So when I read the Secrets of Athleticism book, um, I was like, okay, all right, well, if that's the case, then I got to figure out how I'm going to work my feet. And like I started doing the towel grabbing exercise, stuff like that, you know, using the tools that, were, that you made available very generous, <clears throat> very generously. And um, I think it was maybe a year and a half uh, where I'm not, I'm not going to front. I've tried to reach out and I tried to reach out maybe a couple of months after, but I don't know what medium or like, maybe, like I, I don't know if you were getting like a lot of emails or whatever have you. But um, after that, I was like, okay, well, you know what? I'm going to take some time to internalize this information, keep working through it. Uh, and I found, yeah, after I had gone through some other experiences, like uh, one of the examples I was saying before about taking the, going to the tough mother was, um, you know, I used to have like a lot of knee pain on my, or my IT band on the left leg would be severely, like I couldn't do much. There was a period of time when I would, it would, you know, I climbed a, what did we do? We did one of those, we were in California and we climbed up the mountain where you can like walk your way up and it takes like all day to do. And by the time I came down, that thing was sore. I had to talk to it to make it back down. Um, but after applying the fascia tension perspective during this tough mother, amongst other things, there's, you know, eight miles, 25 obstacles, you know, I had, you know, a tremendous amount of energy. Me and my brother did it together. Didn't stop to drink no water. Um, wasn't really thirsty afterwards. Um, because my body was just bouncy. You know, it was the, the idea that, um, yeah. So, so basically after that, I was like, okay, I'd like to go and, and take this up a notch because I think that there's sometimes when you can go and take yourself to a place and then sometimes to tip the scale, you just need to talk to the, the person who's really been focused on this a lot. Um, the internet makes it great that you can learn. And anybody who's listening, anybody who goes on this man's Instagram, there's more than enough information that he just puts out there for you to like, you know, get start yourself. But if you really want to know, or if you really want to feel based on like his continuous work, taking that class. I mean, I go to jujitsu and I take three classes back to back. Don't drink water until the end and I'm fine. And I sweat very little. Um, but this man had me sweating um, in two minutes. And I was, <laughs> <laughs> I was basically standing still resisting in a very particular way. And that was enough to tell my body that, hey, this is unfamiliar. Uh, let's get this going and feel a, you know, a new sense of electricity. And so, I, yeah, I went there to, to talk to you to have that experience, uh, yeah, a year and some change later. Cool. So, so how's, your, how's your knee doing now after the, uh, after the training? Uh, I mean, I don't really have much of a challenge with that. In fact, I'll tell you this. So we, we have this, uh, war in our warm-up, we have, uh, I don't know what it's called. I think it's like the crocodile crawl or whatever. Um, but since doing the fascial training specifically with you, I started to do like a more springy, like I'll jump into the next crawl. And so, um, and I found considering that, you know, the, the, the springiness in the fascia is really what gets it going. Um, you know, it's, it's one of those things that um, continues to uh, compound on itself. And, uh, and yeah, and so, you know, not only, I mean, I don't feel much anything and anymore, but also there's much more of a bounce. Right. Uh, uh, yeah, much more of a bounce. And that's really all I can really say about that. How do you, how do you feel doing the training specifically comparing to uh, jiu-jitsu training you had previously um well so the effect that it had on the jiu-jitsu um because what's in <laughs> what's so what's very counterintuitive is that the focus with the fascia tensioning makes you looser and that's meaning so what i'm trying to suggest is this what i'm suggesting is that by giving the power to the fascia 
from the root all the other parts of the body that are probably overcompensating for a lack of strength at the root start to loosen up. So your shoulders, the hips, the knee joint, because all of these joints will segment um, and they will hold, they will hold, they hold you together. Like, wait a minute, if we don't hold it together, you're going to fall over. And so they will get strong and tight and overcompensate. And so what I found is, um, my training afterwards, I felt much more limber and, you know, much looser in other places to, to maneuver and, and uh, get moving. So, yeah. And, and, and that training that you had with me and with also with another student, you had a lot of uh, sensation in your foot and the glutes in the posterior. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, and, and, and it was good to have that experience because what it did was it allowed me to, once you get the feeling, once you know and you can recognize what the feeling is supposed to feel like, now you can adjust. You have this biofeedback mechanism where, you know, and, you know, even when I'm standing still, I find myself standing on my toes um, <laughs> without really, like, thinking much about it. I'm just like, oh, I'm looking out the window and I'm on my toes. Right. And, uh, you know, there is this comfort there. And so, yeah, yeah, man. And that's because your glutes is working. It's, 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 it's working the way it should, and your, and your foot strength is there. So a lot of people, especially quad-dominant people, they cannot, they, they, they will struggle uh, when they try to stand with their heel off the ground. And all they feel is quad. They don't feel anything in the glutes. And then their glutes are soft. So what happens during a uh, basketball game or, or during some type of uh, athletic uh, movement? Or, or even in the in a fight, they will they will tend to overcompensate with basically the segmented muscle parts. So whatever muscle part that's the biggest in their body, they will start to be using that. And because their their body is segmented, they they will rely on muscle. And muscle is very uh, it it it, it uh, consumes uh, oxygen very fast. Mm. So they will be all the, all. The, they will be basically gassed out, right? So they yeah. can't really compete with somebody, like you said, who's, who's uh, fascia driven, right? The fascia system is alive and then, and then they're staying relaxed, but yet they're very, very explosive. Mm -hmm. It's very hard to, to fight people like that. Absolutely. Um, man, and it's, and that was really, what's wild is the, it's the it's 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 everything and how it connects so well because even with our respiratory system, the respiratory system is asymmetrical. It's stronger on the right side than it is on the left, um, and so it creates this sort of imbalance um, or or the imbalance is required for us to have balance. But why is that important? Well, we talked about the lymphatic system as well and the difference between being gassed out and gassing down. And a lot of us, um, <clears throat> a lot of us, uh, when we're training, we, there's a theory, and this is really more of a, this is a theory. And uh, the, they've discovered that our, our nervous system, both of our nostrils are pretty much are um, one of them, one of them gas, one is like the gas and one is like the brakes. And the, the right nostril is pretty much your sympathetic nervous system. That's the go, go, go part of you. And then there's the parasympathetic nervous system, which is like the break system. Now, if you look at how the body's set up, remember we told you that the left side of the body connects to both of your feet in the lymphatic system. So essentially, when you think about the breaks, you think about being able to pivot, turn, move, adjust at will, all that stuff. Um, it's all it's all segmented very specifically. Like it's like we we if we start to look at our bodies the way that we look at a car, and the way that a car has the engine, it heats up and it has a cooling system, and that cooling system is way more important than that engine. A lot of times people think about the engine, um, and they overheat and they overwork and they overwork, but it's the cooling system that's important. Um, you know, so when we're sweating you know, and letting off that steam and all of that, that's the cooling system that's going off. And so when, when we're doing this exercise and he has you standing there and you're beaming with sweat, 
um, you know, you're burning the things that need to be burned throughout the system and setting off that cooling system to do what it needs to do the right way. And then next thing you know, your car, your, your, your engine, your machine is much more available to you than it would be otherwise because you're, you're using the entire uh, mechanism correctly. And I think that's where, you know, his passion, you know, for it definitely uh, stems from. It's like, listen, guys, look, <laughs> one place. It's almost like, here you go. Here's an engine. This is how it works, right? You build this engine this way. Your engine will go, 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 no matter whether you are, you know, on the off-road or, you know, you can figure out what you're going to do with the other little pieces to, to deal with your sport or to deal with your physical endeavor. But at the end of the day, that engine needs to be built in a particular way in order for the machine to go and run. And uh, yeah, man, that's what I really like about it. Right. Uh, what do you, what do you, for, for jujitsu, you guys basically train barefoot, correct? Yes. Okay. So uh, have you, since you know about the secret of athleticism, and the hyperarch mechanism and the also the the theory behind the hyperarch metamorphosis have you paid attention to the uh your peers their feet oh yeah um <clears throat> the first thing i did um when i went to, went back to class i was like okay you know there was a depth there was definitely a strong correlate between people who had that sh that strong hyperarch Fosh attention, like one of the, uh, this is an older gentleman, uh, his name is Bradley, and he is, his feet, I look down, he's not, he's not super muscular, he's like, he's tall, very thin, but that man is very strong, um, and when I look down, you know, it's like, you kind of look, some people just looking like, oh, well, like, you know, where is that strength coming from, and then I looked at his feet, and I was like, oh, well, there it is, like, it's, like, you could see it's like wires from his toes, up to you know up to his ankle just like just pure just cables and it's you know so seeing that you know of course the professor um professor's feet he's got fascial tension you know when he's doing particular maneuvers even when even when you're on the ground and your feet are not on and your feet are off the ground you can still see the fascial tension even when people are, you know, making submissions and, you know, doing chokes, you see like it's a full body experience. It isn't just where you are grabbing your opponent. And so, you know, you can see, and then you see the gentlemen or the ladies who don't have the facial tension and you can see that they are a little easier to, you know, maneuver around or, you know, they kind of tip over a lot easier. They don't have a sense of balance or grounding. Um, you know, and I won't, you know, and I, I can't, what I will say is that there are people who are proficient at the art that have a lot of experience and they may not have this mechanism. But what I can tell you is that there is where they, where their skills are, there is like this place where it's like, man, okay, just this one this one advantage of having the fascia tension and recognizing that gives me a little bit more of a fight, even when I'm fighting with people who are m much more senior than I am in the art. Uh, and so, you know, there is that, there's that advantage of being able to play the long game, of being able to stay alive um, in the face of like, you know, danger of dealing with tougher opponents. Right, I agree. And, and currently, what uh, what belt you are right now? I am a four stripe white belt, two seconds away from the blue. Um, so I'm a beginner. I'm a baby um, in the in the art, and uh, you know. And with that, the the thing that <laughs> the thing that uh, comes along is uh, even amongst my classmates and things like that. You know, they question. They ask me why I have so much energy, you know, why, why are they, you know, at the end of a row, <sighs> gassed, and I'm calm, whether I submit them or not, whether I'm submitted or not, the end of it, I haven't expended as much energy. Um, and that, 
that's to me at this level. I think it's it's much more fun at the white belt level to be at that kind of place because it's more showboaty because you're you know you're the new guy, right? Um, but it's less about that at this point. It's more about you know the idea that certain athletic principles sort of it doesn't matter. Those like the rankings start to start mattering so much if people are using their bodies correctly or like in a certain way. I agree. I agree. Um, have you ever seen, because I, I, you had a lot of uh, thoughts and also you have done your own research yeah. on some of the, uh, the martial arts and what you've seen in the past. Can you elaborate that a little bit? I, I find that, because that day when I had the conversation with you, I find that really fascinating. Right. Um, like that, like how you talk about how, you know, even in our language, which is your ex, which, which is your expertise, uh, you talk about how if someone were to say he's showing his ass, right. trying to, showing off his ass, he's trying to show his skills. Right. Yeah. So right. the blues has to be functional. Absolutely. I Absolutely. think that's that's a, such a wonderful analogy. <laughs> Precisely. Um, and so, I mean, basically, there's a theory called embodied cognition. Right. And embodied cognition is basically a fancy way of saying, you know, we think with our brain and our body and that it's one thing that it isn't like, oh, I have thoughts and I have feelings and they're separate. It's like, no, it's like one big bowl of jelly. And so the body, when we say different things like, you know, someone's grounded. Right. How are they grounded? Like, you know, or this person, you know, or thinking on your feet. How are they thinking on their feet? What do these things actually mean? And, you know, yeah, we did. Like, you know, we say, like, yeah, you're showing your ass, you're showing off. Um, you know, why is it that part of the body that is, that is denoted to be, you know, what you're showing off, when you're showing off? Um, but those, you know, those concepts, one of groundedness and one of being able to show your skill, both of those anatomical connections are supercharged by the hyper arch work right um if you are a pushover right when we say someone's a pushover we say that basically you can just the wind can blow and they can fall over that would be the case if you don't have strong glute dominance and strong feet right you can just just boom you fall over um and so basically the one of the arts that i came across was silat and in, in the work that we did, you know, to, you know, art the kata, if you will, we, everything was gliding and just grinding the foot across the floor. The foot never left the floor. And so, you know, the, whereas some kata, you know, you take steps or you do whatever. It's like, nope, you're going to slide across this floor the entire time. And every single one of my peers or the, or, and the superiors, just the people who were there, their feet, the top of their feet. I'd never seen so much muscle on feet before in my life. It's like, as far as, you know, just pure, like I didn't even know that the, that the foot was capable of getting that kind of texture where they had power. And, you know, the hyper think mechanism, I had no idea about that, I hadn't heard about it as of yet, but I saw that there was something about the way that they make us use our feet to create that friction. Um, and you can imagine that back in Indonesia, they're not doing this on like a regular wood floor. They're doing this outside, <laughs> you know, on dirt, on a, on a terrain that isn't um, steady and reliable. And, uh, and the feeling of just having that kind of uh, the callus, being able to like walk. When I lived, um, when I lived, in, uh, I lived in Trinidad for a year, and I remember walking around barefoot and they said to me, oh, you got American feet. You know, like they, they kind of <laughs> joke, you know, that when I would walk, you know, I would be like, oh, you know, they they were just walking through the grass or walking through the dirt or walking through certain things without much pain or any, nothing was bothering them. And, you know, these little, these little touch points in the journey, just bringing all of it together, was just like, okay, wait a minute there this one place if this place isn't weak there's so many things that can go wrong if you can't walk across the terrain 
then you're you're you can't go anywhere and this is about mere survival at this point this is just about being in the environment this has nothing to do with sports this is just every day i live here and this is how we get around from day to day and so you can imagine that if we are designed we are and our bodies are designed to learn how to resist this and it's designed to 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 move and be mobile and you look at those Maasai jumpers, like they don't look, they don't look like class, world class, bodybuilding, anything, but their oh. verticals are through the roof, literally, um, because they're just doing what we're designed to do. Um, with Esther Gokhale, the same thing, like her whole perspective was we have looked at other countries and we've called them savages. There are entire businesses that are built like, I don't know if you, you guys, you know, you hear about barefoot shoes, right? Yeah. The shoes that exactly, their whole business, whole business model, where it's like, yeah, regular shoes ruined your feet. We can sell you the way that you should be walking, but you would have already had this in your body. Exactly. You walked without the shoes in the first place, but that's a whole other story, right? Right. You know, everybody you know, has found basically they're like everything that we said was bad and we demonized at one point and we made it seem like it was beneath, you know, it wasn't, you know, economic or fashionable. It was, wasn't in vogue. Whatever it was is now coming back in vogue um, because we've seen the damage that has been done by doing it the way we've been doing it. Uh, so they're like, yeah, look at these people that live in this country over here, this third world country over here. Look at how they have no back pain. Look at how, look at how they move their hips. Look at how their shoulders, you look at how their shoulders are aligned. Look at how their chest, all of these things because of how they live their day to day life. And so, you know, you wonder why the, what is it? Um, the, was it, uh, there's a book, it was called the golden I don't want to miss, I don't want to miss, but it was a gentleman that was going around and he wanted to understand why certain regions of the world produced certain quality athletes. And he was like, okay, we have state of the art gyms in our country or, or in first world countries that state of the art gyms, but they don't always produce state of the art athletes. And he didn't understand why. And he was like, you know, Jamaica consistently produces fantastic sprinters. Why? And one of the things, you know, they're training in the dust, dirt, backyard of whatever, barefoot, without a track, they're developing hyperarch. But where the same boat trained in like the hyperarch, hyperbolic time chamber somewhere in Jamaica, and that's why he keeps burning everybody at the Olympics, right? And so there is that. Yeah, so I mean, we, so we, uh, so, I have a Chinese background, right? So there is a deep rooted uh, stereotype that the Chinese, uh, Chinese body, the property itself is weaker for mm. some reason because of the, all the, all the, uh, uh, the, the, all the, all the farming background of, mm. of the, the, the Chinese agriculture. Uh -huh. So, so then, uh, you know, when we look at the uh, the Olympics, right? We have yeah. we had the we had the field and track. That the only person, okay, that was able to get a gold in field and track was this guy named Liu Xiang. Mm. And after I, I I I discovered the mechanism, I discovered how it actually works, and discovered the timeline of the metamorphosis. I I was able to find the photos of his feet and and guess what that there is the same signs that you can <laughs> see on, on on usain Bolt's feet right and the, uh, he is completely chinese and usain Bolt is completely uh african or or or, or from uh jamaica mm -hmm. right they're they're two uh thousands of miles away <laughs> they somehow share the same type of metamorphosis and the morphing in their feet and okay. both somehow right win the gold so right. for me that's 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 that's
that's a that's a huge, very profound for me. It's, it's huge, right. because what that means is that uh, you know, first of all, I, I believe I believe genetics does play a role, right? I'm not saying like a lot of people think, oh, you're the you're saying like uh, all you do, all you can do is the training. You have the secret, and then you become elite. What I'm saying is no, 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 no. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying is genetics matters, but if you actually just train and and actually go through the same morphing process of fascia tension in the foot, once your foot start to look like the elite athletes, okay, it doesn't have to be ugly, but once your feet has has to uh, start to develop tension. Okay, your glutes start to, to work, uh, your abs start to, to work, yeah. and you become more holistic. Right. Then you are closer to the elite athlete. Absolutely. What I'm saying, what I'm also saying is you cannot copy the form alone. You know, the, the, when I was training with you, right, I, 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 I use the example of uh, DKU. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there are plenty of videos. I, I think his camp does a fantastic marketing job. Right. right much better than me. I, I, I don't know what his budget is, but his marketing is, it's great. Um, so there are videos of him, right? Showing a, a guy who, who's like really out of shape, how to punch. Mm -hmm. But you can tell, right? When he punches, his heels are automatically raised off the ground. Mm -hmm. So he's punching holistically. Right. Whereas the other person, he, he, that other person's heel is, is like, it's like a lead. It's mm -hmm. stuck on the ground. Right. So when you have this type of punch, even though it's an upper body movement, right? Mm -hmm. But where does the power come from? Right? Yes. So it has to come from glutes. This, this is like there is no scientific dis, uh, dispute on, on, this, uh, on this part. It's that the power comes from the glutes. But, but now when you, when you have somebody to, to, to especially you, you teach someone, to punch like you the number one thing for me because i'm my background is computer science i look at every single little details because you know what the, the program will crash let's say if you if you program something a uh, thousand lines of code and you miss a period or or or, or, or comma or you have a spelling mistake or you have a cap so it's supposed to be a, a lowercase even one letter or one tiny thing it would crash the system Man. So for me, copying every little details matters. Right. So when I when I look at this, I'm like, no, 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 no. You, you can't you can't teach someone where where that person cannot learn what you are trying to teach them. I mean, I mean, I'm not saying he's he's not a great guy, right? What I'm saying is from from a technical perspective, if you are trying to copy something, you better copy everything or right. nothing at all. Mm -hmm. If you're copying just what you can see, that's not a true copy. Right. You have to copy the exact thing as much as possible. Right. Then you can, you can get close to the results. And for me, learning, right, it's all self-learning. There is no such a thing as, okay, this is a great master. He's going to pass down everything he's got to you. Right. There is no such thing. It's right. really you teaching yourself. Absolutely. Right. So yes, what sir. I'm saying is you have to know exactly what is the master doing. Right. Even though that information might be hiding in the subconscious. Right. Otherwise, you are not going to get anywhere near this master's level. And, and many people ask me about, OK, so you're saying uh, uh, the elite athletes have this uh, fascia tensioning. Why don't they talk about it? Well, the, the, the answer is like this, right? So, so, for example, you on the other side of the computer screen, you are breathing. Right. And I'm breathing also. But breathing is a subconscious thing. Mm. We, don't, we don't intentionally think about breathing, but we do. Right. The same thing with fascial tension. People can put, when they walk or move around, they can automatically put tension in their foot. You would not know. And he would not know either because this is a subconscious response. Just like when you get pinched, you feel, oh, this is, this is hurting, right? Right. It's a subconscious response. So the idea is, is that if I don't know how many times you breathe a minute, for example, and you don't know how many, how many times I breathe a minute, there is no way for me to tell you, hey, you are breathing incorrectly. 
or you tell me, okay, wow, you are breathing so, so slow, you know, because right. you don't know. Right. And you don't even know how, 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 how fast or slow you're breathing either. So now we're, we're like, we're all, all like basically like, like playing poker. We, we don't know your information and you don't know my information. And now we have a, uh, a society where it says, okay, the, the athleticism come from muscle. Okay. And everybody's like, you know, because, you know, we, the school sort of breed the, the authority, you know, don't challenge authority. You, this is what it is. You, this is, you remember all these answers and you get a hundred, you get an eight, right? There is no, there's very little like, like uh, the kids that actually challenges uh, the, the teachers, they don't end up well in school. <laughs> but maybe later on that they can do, be an entrepreneur, but not in the school level. So the, here's the thing, right? Here's the thing that I'm, I'm, I'm keep telling people, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that I could, uh, through your help, to deliver the message, right? Because you're an ex you're expert in, uh, in linguistics, is that the, the, the subconsciousness, it, it, we don't know, right? So what I'm saying is if you actually put a lot of tension in your feet, over time, you don't know you're putting a lot of tension in the feet. But there are signs in the feet that tells you, oh, this guy put a lot of, a lot of tension in the feet. But the person that didn't, right, there are signs too. Just like what you said, like when you go to Jamaica or Trinidad, sorry, uh, they'd be like, oh, you have American feet. Like they already know. Yeah, yeah. So it's, it's, it's that type of thing. Like, like when I go, uh, uh, when I actually, I, I, not only I look at the, the Chinese athletes who, who do sprinting, I look at all different type of athletes. It's, you know, I, I, I'm a big fan of uh, UFC. Um, I, I look at the elite fighters. Uh, so so one, one of the guys that I follow is uh, Dimitri is Johnson, mm -hmm. right? So he had many fights. He's very successful. So, right. so one thing I don't know if you notice is that when he's, when he's uh, constantly attacking the opponent, when he's trying to grapple and get to the optimal position on top of the opponent in a dominant uh, position, if you look at his feet, what his feet and toes are doing, they are squeezing. They are actually, actually putting a lot of tension. And then I look at the defender, right? The defender who he, he actually put, has been pinned down. That right. guy usually don't put tension in the foot. Or very little tension, even though that guy is trying to like, um, uh, trying to uh, prevent Demetrius Johnson from choking him out. But right. if you look at his feet, all the toes are very close to the ball of the foot. Right. Now, you, now like I, I see other uh, 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 foot uh, specialists, they're saying, okay, your foot, your toes should be straight, and mm -hmm. they actually show the bottom of the foot, like they actually show a gap between the the. The, the toe pad and the uh, metatorsal, right? Mm -hmm. They show there's a gap. Right. So what I'm saying is no, 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 no. If your foot is actually uh, goes through the faster tensioning process, the toe pad and the metatorsal are going to be very close together because you are constantly putting in tension. Right, right. So, so that's that's something that I that I like. I I really. Uh, pay special attention to and you know i it, it, there they, i am willing to you know put my name out there and have you know acad academic debates right but the most time most of the time on social media it's 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 really not it's like some guy who, who doesn't know better and then they 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 say hey you know you're wrong you're wrong you're wrong and then here's an example of some other of foot authority they said this is this this is that you know like like for me I, I can't debate that. I can't because for me, first of all, I, I know what I know and I know my method works. I have vision one athlete that comes out from the system. I know exactly what it does to the body. I know it's very powerful and it's very beneficial. I, those, those, um, you know, like those, uh, uh, foot specialists, they might be very good at their area. Right. But it's not the same area that I'm in. So that's something that I don't, I don't want to get into, like debating, because I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to uh, put them down. You know, I'm simply saying, hey, this is the area of my expertise. Mm -hmm. I can take somebody who's, who is uh, uh, quad dominant into somebody, convert it to somebody who is glutes dominant.
Mm -hmm. That's my expertise. And as far as if this guy's going to be a uh, million dollar athlete or, or not, it all depends on the person. If that person wants to put in the work, he is going to get there no matter what. And my information is going to be super, super useful. And my, my experience and expertise is going to be super, super useful because I know exactly what happens, you know, at each different timeline of the metamorphosis because everybody is a little bit different. Everybody uses their feet a little bit differently and yeah. everybody uses the tension differently also. Right. So now you have athletes that are in different levels and I can tell you at that level what will likely to happen and what is the, what is the weakness at certain levels. For example, level three, so the, the way that we identify level three to level four is that you level three, you only feel the, te- the, the sensation up to your glutes. Your abs and your glutes are still segmented. But remember when you came to, 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 to our gym and I, when we did the evaluation, your abs – you, when you put tension in your abs, you feel your glutes. Yes, sir. Right? Yes, sir. So what that means is that your fascia connection from your abs to the glutes are there. And there are a lot of people that I gave the free uh, assessment to. Right. They don't have that, like, they flex their abs, there's nothing. Zero sensation in the glutes. So their body is segmented. So right. let's say if you and them get into a cage and start fighting, Right? My money is on you. Even though I don't know, no, I don't know if you got a technique down, but my my because based on my work, as long you you stay alert, as long the the time the duration of the the fight goes on, you're gonna be the winner. Based on my research. Absolutely. I mean, I take it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying, um, and I hear what you're saying because the challenge with debating the the. Because everybody that's that's the in the field, like people who do podiatry and stuff like that, they are they are speaking about the foot from its protected state, and so everything that they're saying is actually very valid for the foot in its protected state. Exactly. So you put on a shoe, which is, I mean, when you think about the hyperarch mechanism, it's basically everything that we've created. We've created to sort of. Uh, take the place of something that the body would do on its own. And so like people who live in third world countries who walk barefoot, their foot becomes a shoe by way of walking. It's so it just toughens and it hardens. And so if you're, if you're lucky enough to have a shoe within the shoe, then you have, you know, you have double the shoe now. Now you're able to actually use some of that extra, all the stuff that Nike puts in those sneakers you actually get to use it because you put in a shoe in the shoe versus a very soft and gentle and dainty foot inside of the shoe, which will give you different results. Um, and so, you know, the, the professionals in their, ex, in their places, they are professionals in their expertise based on the environment that they're dealing with. And they're dealing with people who wear shoes all the time. Um, but when you're talking about, you know, uh, just bare bones, human body potential. Like what is it able to do when it doesn't have any protective mechanism to soften it? And that goes, you know, it's funny because we say things like, oh, this person has thick skin. Why do we use that as a metaphor for someone who's tough? That's great. (laughs) We say like, oh, this person has thick skin because something life circumstances have toughened their exterior to the point where they seem impenetrable and so when you we wear certain things we put certain things on you know yes we've done you know we've made different sports safer but you look at football american football versus rugby these guys are not wearing half of the equipment right and they you know these are some tough guys it's boom you know not to take away from american football players because they got to be tough as well um, however, there's a different level and layer of that because they are, they are protected. They have protection. Um, and so when you, when you put yourself in an environment where you have less protection, even something like playing the guitar, though you play in the guitar, your body goes, okay, you keep pressing on these, these uh, thin strings and you keep pressing on them pretty hard. We're going to develop a nice little callus here so that this isn't um, this isn't set us off and set up the alarms. It doesn't, you don't get these pain responses. I mean, it, it's really brilliant when you think about it, especially when you say it from a self-learning perspective, is that 
we go through these experiences and the body is intelligent enough. Because even where, whatever our fascia locks, it's locked itself in place. It's not so much, you know, A or B is so lazy they can't work. It's just that your body is so smart that it goes, oh, so you do this thing every day, the same way every day. Okay, good. We're going to build this nice reinforced fascial tension. Um, and that will be why you can't bend down and touch your toes. Now, if you were to bend down and touch your toes every day because that was something you did daily, then your fascia is smart enough to eventually adjust. But all of, but the body will take your habits and make them easier for you to do. And so with the hyper arch mechanism, it's like the, the transformation is meant to be for your benefit. It's so if you put your foot under the right stress, your body goes, oh, okay. So we need to build this tension so that whatever this body has to do, it can do it with the least amount of effort. And that's where you get these world-class athletes. This is where you get people who make things look like a cakewalk that if we try to do them ourselves, we'd be exhausted to no end, right? And, you know, yep. that, you know, so you can't, so the argument with people who are like, well, you know, this person said, you know, okay, fine. If you're talking to somebody who's telling me, you know, well, we have an exoskeleton, so we don't need to toughen our skin. That may not, that information is not going to be as valuable to someone who doesn't have the advantage of an exoskeleton, right? They, they're going to need to adapt the way they need to adapt. I think in the future, if our bodies keep going the way we're going, we're going to have like robot suits and we'll just be like tiny, you know, very fragile little beings on the inside and diagnosing the body won't be as big a deal because they'll just fix the exoskeleton instead of fixing the, the body inside right but for I, right i like how you think yeah <laughs> I, I, I often wonder what the future will hold but i also know that if you win if you put in the work to the present the yeah. future will will be shaped absolutely absolutely and that is the point and so with the metamorphosis you know, this graduation, if you will, you know, we're born with a body that knows it's, it knows how to figure its way out. Like we, we forget that we have survived like hundreds of thousands of years before modern medical science. Like we, we got here somehow, <laughs> right? Like a lot of, there were in the, the cost of living, you know, by, you know, outside, not mean from an economic perspective, but just the cost to live or the cost to survive um, was much greater. You know, we had a lot more daily challenges and daily possibilities that would threaten our lives. And so, you know, whatever bodies that, we, whatever we're born, whatever genetic imprints are given to us, it's to give us, each and every one of us, our best chance to, to survive while we're here. Uh, you know, if, you, if we, you know, we're adults, if you use sperm as an example, every single human being that is alive beat a lot of motherfuckers to get here. Like there were 500 million possibilities and only you got here, right? right. So you, the manual, you, you just drove and you did it. And so the body is designed, that same body that got you here, that same little swimming guy that got you here, is the same, it's the same energy, the same mechanism that's supposed to get us through the next stage of life with our best chance to survive. And so if, the, if our feet naturally form a callus and develop a certain level of strength, that's for a purpose for us to have our best shot at mobility to get to wherever it is that we got to go. I, I love it. I love how you how you how you say it, how you speak it, even your tone of voice. I'm, I'm thinking, uh, you know, at certain time, I, I'm I'm thinking like I'm talking to uh, Larry uh, Fishburne. From the <laughs> 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 uh, Appreciate <it>. Morpheus. <laughs> <laughs> yes. you give me the wheel, man. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think I think our conversation is uh, is uh, quite long at the, right now. I think oh, yeah. I'm going to end it here. But thank you for all your input and thank you for putting up the time uh, to speak with me and share with, uh, you know, share this wonderful uh, uh, recording with my 
uh, my fans. I, I really, I'm really grateful. Man, I appreciate it, brother. It's really cool to um, to 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 be a, a part of this journey with you, man. As you embark on this next stage of it, I um, so you know the work. Being it is easy to speak to it because I've applied what you taught. You know what I mean? It's, right. It isn't like this is my opinion about hyper art. It's like no, this is what has happened because of a hyper art. And so, you know. And as, you know, as someone who is more of an enthusiast, hobbyist, you know, uh, athlete, if you will, to see and feel more stronger, faster, and better in my 30s than I did in my 20s. You right. Know, you know, that's it's a powerful thing, my friend. Yes, yes. I think uh, a lot of people, when they listen to you, they, they will be motivated. 